welcome margaret welcome to this journey thank you so much for taking this time out well it's my pleasure it's really nice to be talking to you thank you um first of all i must admit margaret i read this book and over the last 8 years that i have been on this journey of self discovery i picked up books but i actually left them halfway this is <laughs> this is one book that i can say i have read the entire book and i'm so so thankful to you for writing this wonderful wonderful book full of so many stories so many wonderful stories from across the world and across disciplines so thank you so much for writing this book well thank you for finishing it that's a great compliment <laughs> <laughs> um let me start with a small sentence that that stood out for me and it said that for years now we've now been encouraged to develop brand you an unwavering and fixed position now when i look at this and i put put it coin and coincide this with something that i heard you talk about in other podcasts and other shows is that people would come up to you and ask you about brexit and ask you about trump uh there is also this phenomena that we see right now where everyone suppose everyone is supposed to have an opinion on everything uh how would you how would you join these things together and uh help us understand the beginning of your journey writing this book hmm. well it's it's interesting i think you're right you know everybody everybody's supposed to have an opinion about everything and i think it's um i think it's quite difficult to say actually i have no idea except it's a more interesting conversation if you can do that and say i don't know what do you think you know let's let's explore this together rather than just swap positions so <clears throat> what i mean is i think it's a much more interesting conversation to say i don't really know what's going on with brexit what are you saying what am i saying rather than i think it's great i think it's terrible now where do we go right um and i think you know for a number of reasons partly this this sense that we have to have opinions about everything even or especially the things about which we know nothing right? um it, it seems to be harder to have those conversations and i've been very struck the last month i've been spending reading a whole bunch of books about kind of how people deal with conflict how people have conversations and these are books that come out next year and i think what's so striking is you know i pick these books up and i think well why are these books being written and i think they're being written because people actually i don't know why this is but people seem to have lost the capacity to just have a very discursive exploratory conversation they seem to feel they have to nail their position before they start whereas it seems to me the more interesting conversation is you know i'm interested in this do you know anything about it you know i can tell you what i know you can tell me what you know let's see what we can think together and we don't necessarily have to come to a conclusion or we don't necessarily have to agree but we'll learn more by talking to each other that way then just me planting my flag in the ground and you planting your flag in the ground and then just staring at each other interesting so i just you know i think i mean i think you know i think the business world is full of bad ideas <laughs> which over time die thank god because they turned out to be bad ideas i think one of the worst ideas was this idea of the brand you that we're all commodities and we're all selling ourselves in a marketplace and we have to have a brand identity so that people will buy us and it's sort of um, i mean it's you know my my publishers always uh say to me you know we love your books margaret because they they cover so they're so broad in their range and their sort of psychology and their business but they're also about life and history and it's great but the problem is <laughs> we don't know where to put you in the bookstore <laughs> and to which my answer is what you mean there's still bookstores <laughs> right um but i say but but that that's the thing 
you're looking to put me in a box and I, I write in order not to be in a box. And I don't think that life is experienced in a box. I don't think I am just a business person. I don't think I'm just somebody who's interested in poetry or theater or psychology or economics. I'm interested in all of those things because all of those things are in life and I experience them together. And I absolutely recognize that this is bad for my brand, right? <laughs> because it's too complicated, but I'm not selling a brand. I'm trying to have a rich and interesting life. Interesting. In fact, as you were speaking, though I've not read the other books, but I read some summary and some of your talks on the other book. I, I think it also very neatly connects with your book, on, your book called Beyond Measure and Willful Blindness. Uh, the way I see, and you can correct me if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm not on point on this, is that there are the measurables and there are the immeasurables. And yeah. because immeasurables are subjective, you need to have patience, you need to have a very different kind of depth to even begin to uh, A, open vulnerability, at the same time explore that you may not get anywhere or you may be wrong in getting somewhere. And because a lot of people do not have that, they hold on to these measurables. So that's one part of the story. Mm -hmm. And again, on the willful blindness thing, I believe uh, because people, are, so there are two, two moves happening as I see. One is the complexity in the world, which you so beautifully point out in your book, uh, is increasing. Mm -hmm. So which means that a person will need to spend a lot of time and understanding, getting a grasp and depth of these diverse set of things that are affecting the world and the world is working. And because people do not have that, they find it convenient to switch off from those things and those conversations. Mm -hmm. Would you agree and expand on that? If you, if you think yeah. that? Yeah. No, I think, I mean, I think what you've said is, is very eloquent and it's a very, you know, it's a very good deep reading of my work. I think also that over the last 20 years, we've been persuaded that, you know, economics will explain everything and everything that matters can be measured. And, um, and I think that's wrong. I, I think many things that can be measured do matter. But I also think that measurement doesn't show us everything. I don't think, for example, that all of the economic data about a country tells you about that country. I think there are lots of things about that country that are not in there. Um, and I remember I was, I was uh, speaking at a conference uh, hosted by Oxford University once, and I sat through a whole day of presentations where it was all about culture and employee engagement and incentives. And it was very clear that the underlying philosophy was if you give people incentives, they will do the right thing. And it was, I mean, it was, I thought sort of insulting to human beings because it was really, it was treating employees kind of like, I don't know, horses or dogs, you know, this is how we can train them to do what we, the governing classes, think they should do. And the, I was supposed to do the summary at the end. And I said, you know, I think you should, guys should need to start thinking about what happens if you have no incentives? What do you think people would do? Why are you so afraid of them for one thing? But also what makes you think that they need incentives to do the right thing? Why don't you trust them? I said, you know, what incentive is there for me to love my children? What is there, in, what incentive is there? What incentive do I receive or does anybody think about, you know, to enjoy a walk in the countryside? You know, this is, this is a huge driver in human life and you guys just completely ignore it. I said, I've run companies for 20 years. I have never ever in my life given anybody a bonus because I think that they're toxic. And I have had seen some of the best work done by some of the best people I've ever had the privilege to work with. 
So, you know, what is it that makes you think that the numbers are the only truths in this situation? And I'm not saying that they're irrelevant at all. I'm just saying that if you think everything's in the numbers, then you miss a lot. And I remember also um, interviewing the chairman of my tech companies when I was living in the States. And he invested in about 40 companies. He had a very, very rich and diverse portfolio. And I remember saying to him once, you know, David, how do you know what's going on in all of these companies? I mean, it's hard enough for me with my one company, right? And he said, I just look at the numbers. Now, David was a very brilliant mathematician, but there were things about some of his companies I knew that he did not know. And I didn't have any numbers on them. I knew which ones had really healthy cultures and which ones had really toxic cultures. And I knew, I knew in particular one that was working on a tech platform that simply did not work. And he didn't know any of that. And I wasn't even really paying attention to the other, these other companies very much. So I just think, you know, that there is a great deal more in the world than is measurable. And that to the degree that we pay attention only to the measurable, we very often overlook the things that matter most. I also think, and this is, as you know, in Uncharted, I think that, you know, most strategic thinking, so-called, in companies is done by looking at spreadsheets of, you know, revenue and expenditure and kind of playing around with the numbers. Um, and I th that will get you a long way. Let's be clear about that. But there are all sorts of brilliant things that that will never show you. And I think the example I'm most proud of, or not most proud of, the example that I like most is the example of the Dutch home care nursing outfit, where one of the nurses, you know, hates industrialized medicine and how bureaucratic it is and how you get a contract for a patient that tells you exactly what to do, which means the nurses have no freedom or creativity and no time for it either. And so they do this beautiful experiment where they say, okay, well, let's instead, let's just see, let's just try something different. And they say to the nurses, okay, here's the deal. When you get a patient, do what you think is the best thing for the patient. You're trained nurses, you should know what to do. And let's just clock how it works and see what happens. And the upshot of this experiment is that the patients get better in half the time and the cost of running the service falls by 30%. Now there is no way you would get to that outcome by manipulating a spreadsheet. You just never get there. And I think there is something really spectacular and wonderful about the human brain that can come up with a different way of doing something without quantifying it that yields such a spectacular result. Now, of course, lots of experiments like that don't work. That's fine. But, you know, the human brain is the most complex thing in the known universe. And yet we treat it like it's the most simple, like it can only understand cause and effect. And in that we, we waste the most precious, remarkable thing that has got us where we are today. Interesting. And I think the human brain has this capacity, often unconsciously, to deal with complexity in a way that once we try to put it all down on a spreadsheet and kind of make it all add up, we lose. We take something brilliant and we make it banal. True, true. In fact, this uh, staying with what you just said in terms of the, the how, how little we understand about the human workings, human beings, and the workings of the brain, uh, I'm reminded of some work that is that, that are now coming out for the last 20 years People like Antonio Damasio, who's a neuroscientist. Yeah. Uh, there is Ian McGilchrist from, from yeah. UK. Yeah. And, yeah. and these thinkers and these scientists are pointing towards the, the, the way in which the explicable works with the inexplicable. 
the accessible works with the inaccessible. Yeah. And in whichever labels we use in terms of emotion, the word emotion, the word intuition, the right brain or whatever, I think there are, there are uh, tremendously beautiful ways in which they, they function and they need to be harnessed. In fact, that brings us to this wonderful, uh, substantial uh, space in your book that you spent on uh, describing the journeys of artists. In, mm -hmm. And in fact, what, what also stood out for me is your husband's a scientist, your daughter's in theater, and your son's in music. <laughs> and did that have, to, and you yourself have a 13 years, uh, you know, at, at BBC. Uh, did that have a role to play in this chapter in some sense? Yeah, what an interesting insight. Um, I mean, it's important to say, I think my, my husband's very sad that nobody in the family became a scientist. <laughs> As his father is a scientist. And I think there was a hope, you know, that one member of the family would be a scientist. But on the other hand, they're still young. So you never know, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm glad you picked on that chapter, partly because I had to fight quite hard to keep it in the book. Um, because, you know, brand Margaret as business person, you know, what was it doing in there was the view of my editor. And I'm very proud of that chapter. It's very close to my heart, as I think you saw. Um, and just picking up for a second about what you said about Damasio and, and Ian McGilchrist, you know, I mean, I, I love their work, but I think especially be, Ian McGilchrist, because he understands that the minute we make something binary, we lose so much about the connectivity between these things, you know. Um, but I do think that uh, the way that artists think and experience the world and how they use the experience of the world is a really thought provoking and valuable way of seeing how much we miss when we don't give ourselves the time and the freedom to have experiences and have the time to process them and investigate them and so on. And I think that we often, you know, we're so keen for a result or we're so competitive that we feel we have to just consume and produce, consume and produce, and never mind the period of reflection and experimentation, which is where the really fascinating stuff comes from and um and i think that artists equally have huge amounts to teach all of us about how to deal with uncertainty because everything in an artist's life is uncertain and even you know very well established artists who we might look at and think well you know they're rich and famous you know now anything they make will sell you know that's not their experience. Their experience is when I start a new book or a new painting or a new piece of music, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to take me somewhere and I won't be able to figure out what to do. I don't know if it'll take me somewhere where I've been before and that would be kind of disappointing. Or it'll take me somewhere where I suddenly see all kinds of new things. And every step along the way is fraught with uncertainty. And I, um, you know, I'm very struck that lots of people think of artists as either very childlike or terribly fragile. But, you know, all of my work with writers and musicians and artists of many kinds has shown me these are really some of the strongest, toughest people in the world because they can contain that anxiety and they can deal with it and turn it into something really productive because it doesn't stop them. It doesn't mean that the uncertainty isn't uncomfortable for them, but it doesn't mean they just sort of stop and run back to certainty, right? They keep going. And I think, you know, there's this touching thing that Tracy Emin said in my book, which is that sometimes when she's starting a, a new painting, she's so anxious that she has to draw for a while to kind of work up her courage. And, you know, I wouldn't compare myself with Tracy Emin, but I often have my greatest anxiety attacks 
before I start writing something. And it's ridiculous, you know, I mean, I've written six books and God knows how many articles by now, you know, but it's just, it is diving into the unknown. And, and the books don't get easier. They generally get harder. <laughs> and it's really funny because in every book I've ever written, there's been one chapter that just was just a torment. And the first time I encountered this was with my first book. And I thought, this is the chapter, this is the moment in which I learned I'm not really a writer. And the second book I wrote, when I hit that really difficult chapter, I thought, oh, this is the well-known second book problem where you realize you actually don't have anything left to say. And the third time I hit it with my third book, I thought, this is that chapter. <laughs> No matter what you do, Margaret, just keep going, just keep going, right? And the huge difficulty with Uncharted, which really took me aback, is it turned out the really difficult chapter was the first one, and that I was not prepared for. That was like, oh my God. And then I just thought, well, you just have to keep going. You just have to keep going. And the other thing I learned along the way was that by and large, the really hard chapters are the ones I end up liking most because it's where I discovered the most. Interesting. But, you know, so, so what I guess what I'm saying is what I think we can learn from artists is not that uncertainty isn't uncomfortable. It's always uncomfortable, but you can get through it. And when you get through it, you discover things and the discovery makes it all worth it but if you quit you never learn a thing true in fact uh, when i started my corporate career almost a couple of decades back i remember walking into some meetings and some corporate houses and people would say that the following phrases were like very very prominent be professional don't be emotional and and here we are after 20 years, we find emotional intelligence being taught and so uh, yeah. prominent. So I think that that gives me a lot of optimism that, you know, uh, at the time when emotions were not talked about in the workplace, but now is a boardroom agenda sometimes. Yeah. I believe that this, this uh, uh, provision and encouragement of uh, leaders to afford their employees and their colleagues to dabble in spaces which may not yield result immediately, uh, which may be just hobbies or they may come back and integrate it back into some way, uh, would also find its feet in some time. Would yeah. you agree with that? I would absolutely agree with that. And like you, I share you know, the belief that, that emotion is a form of intelligence and that you can either suppress it or you can learn from it. And I think work is always emotional. I mean, not every minute of every day, obviously, but you know, people invest the most precious thing they have in work, which is their time. So, you know, it's not always easy, but if you need more money, it's possible to make more money. We think money is the most precious thing. It absolutely isn't. I'm not saying it's not important, but it's not the most precious thing. Because, you know, whether you're talking about money or food or, you know, these things we can get more of. But time you can never get more of. So every minute I spend, you know, working for a company or a person or with people or whatever, that is time I will never get back. I can never say, actually, that was a waste of time. I'll go spend it over here. It's gone. So if I'm investing the single most precious thing I have in a job, in a company, in a colleague, why shouldn't I be emotional about it? Why shouldn't I want it to have real value? Why shouldn't I want us to do a fantastic job? And, you know, and if you, you know, if you approach it that way, of course, it sets a very high standard 
It means you expect a lot of yourself and a lot of your colleagues. But isn't that the way that you should be? Don't you want to spend your time as well as you possibly can? So that's, I think, the way I think about it, which is, I think, denying emotion at work just makes it harder for people to think about it. Interesting. And I think you covered that in, in, in some interesting ways when you cite the example of the, I think, the chief data, data, sign, data officer in the Bank of England. Uh -huh. when, he, when he afforded the, uh, he, he created this new initiative where he got the employees to do, uh, you know, something yeah. that he was not prepared earlier. Can you share that example if it's, if it's top of your mind right now? Yes, certainly. Um, so this is also a lot continuing the theme, if you like, of experiments. So this is the chief data officer at the Bank of England who knew that there was going to be more and more and more data to be processed and more and more analysis of that data. And he also knew that nobody was going to give him any more resources. So he thought, how on earth are we going to cope with this? And, you know, he could have got his senior leadership team together and they'd all go off for a day or two to, and try to, you know, reorganize the org chart or do something to make everything more productive. Um, and instead, he, he did an experiment himself because he'd never done this before, which is he just brought the company together and he explained, this is the situation, this is where we are. We've got to unlock some extra productivity in the organization because otherwise we're just gonna you know, work everybody to death, which is not acceptable. So he said, I want your ideas, you know, stuff that we can try and see, does it really help? And lots of things surprised him. First of all, what surprised him was how many ideas he got. Um, lots of them they tried and some were phenomenal and some were terrible. You know, somebody said, well, we should all get to go to the senior leadership team weekly meeting so we know what's going on it seems a bit secretive so they tried that and you know discovered that actually wasn't terribly interesting and wasn't a very good use of time and everybody stopped coming somebody else suggested that the way that they did annual performance reviews was really slow and turgid and unhelpful without insight so they radically redesigned that and really made a big difference to how people felt about their personal and professional development within the organization and then some very, very junior data scientists suggested a different way of coding the data. And they tried that with a sample data set and made a 10x improvement. And, you know, what the chief data officer said was, you know, these experiments just kept coming and coming and coming. And so they found all sorts of different ways of making people more committed, more creative, more... Um, engaged, more able to do a variety of things. And he said, you know, for him, the big experiment had been, which he hadn't really realized at the time, was the experiment of asking everybody. And he said, I realized that there was a phenomenal quality of strategic thinking across the whole organization, not just at the top. I used to think, he said, you know, that, that this kind of thinking was only at the top and actually it's all over the place. And so he, it's not just that he solved his problem, but he'd seen that there was productive potential everywhere, not just in the places where tradition would say it was to be found. Interesting. And this, this, this phenomena of, of everybody's got the potential to imagine and ah. hence, if provided a space, they could contribute uh, if it's harnessed in the right manner. It's ah. also beautifully uh, exemplified in another thing that you pointed out about the nursing company in, in I think, Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's also a beautiful example of how uh, a decentralized uh, uh, trusting in people, letting them do, take their own decisions on the go is again yeah. an example of how uh, a very different kind of organization structure is also taking shape in the corporate world. And I think, um, I mean, this is quite a recurrent theme in my books. And it's very influenced by an experience I had when I was running one of my tech companies in the US, where we had a, a gigantic problem, which was essentially the technology we built 
the more users we had, the more expensive it became to run the business, right? So this is a, this is a death, this is a, a, a real near death experience because if the more successful you are, the higher your costs go, you never become profitable, right? So you've got to solve this problem. And, um, and the engineering team just could not figure it out. And so at one point I just brought the whole company together and said, this is the problem. And of course the engineering team is going to keep working at it. But if anybody, anybody, anybody has an idea, you know, speak up. And, um, and the problem was solved by somebody, not an engineer, somebody who could not write a single line of code. Now that didn't mean that they could solve it themselves, but they came up with a way of thinking about the problem, which the engineers could then implement. And it saved our bacon completely. And it was just, and, and, and this is, you know, so that's a very, very visceral memory for me. But since then, you know, I've, I've looked a lot at the emergence of open innovation platforms. And this happens a lot. So open innovation platforms like Incentive are places where uh, companies will, will publish problems they're trying to solve that they just can't figure out. And anybody in the world can submit a potential solution. And sometimes there are cash prizes. And a lot of people do it just for the intellectual pleasure of it. But one of the things that's become clear over time is that very frequently problems are being solved by people who are working outside their domain expertise. So a, a problem to do with um, a disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, which was you know, looking for a biomarker to identify the disease. That was solved by a plant biologist. Now, you know, it's not a plant biology problem, right? It's a human biology problem, but you could think about it in a different way. There's another problem to do with oil spills and cleaning up oil spills, which was solved by a cement engineer. It's not a cement problem, but it turns out it is about viscosity. And he could just think about it without all the expertise that oil and gas engineers have. So he had a much freer approach to it. And, and this, is, this happens a very great deal. And, um, and what happens in organizations is everybody gets, it comes back to brand new, right? Everybody gets put in their box. And if it's a finance problem, it can only be addressed by a finance person. If it's an engineering problem, only engineers even know about it. And, and yet the whole premise of organizational life is that groups of people can solve more problems and see more solutions than individuals working alone. And so we trap lots of imagination and creativity and capacity by the structures that we build hoping to make organizations efficient. And I think the cost of that efficiency, which is always invisible, is often staggeringly high. In the case of my company, had we, had we continued to see it only as an engineering problem, the cost would have been, it would have killed the company. Interesting. There's the brand you, there is the, uh, it is expected of many of us to have an opinion on everything. Uh, given the digital world that we live in, everyone's sort of on a ramp now. So you got to be always performative in some sense, or at least that's, that's the only identity that is left of, uh, yeah. which is credible enough. And then there is this whole phenomena, which uh, I picked up from what Jonathan Haidt and George Lukianoff wrote in the book called The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, the phenomena where a lot of, uh, a whole generation was uh, somewhere not, not, not allowed to have playfulness and negotiate their own disagreements. And they grew up in a sort, sort of an atmosphere where they're seeking safe spaces and trigger warnings 
uh, when we when we put all of this together and then we put them out in the world in in different environments and let's say even the corporate environment uh, i see that we are actually pushing them towards a cliff because they would go for the measurements they would go they would avoid anything which is very difficult and willfully turn blind and then the and then as you as you very beautifully pointed out in your conversation with uh, uh, with johnson at uh, 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 inet where you said that there are the sins of omission and sins of commission mm. and, and you said that you you were pleasantly surprised that willful blindness was about uh, there's something to see but why can't you see it and here there is nothing to see or how can you see it Yeah. So, how how do you put all of this together? I mean, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, I'm just putting a lot of things together in some yeah, sense. Yeah, it's right. I mean, you're absolutely, you know, you're very perceptive because you can see that actually all of these ideas are very, very connected. Yeah. I think that. Um, I mean, I think the issue of the sort of coddled, the coddled generation. I th- I would say two things about that. I think. I think a, a great number of western education systems are have ended up being designed to persuade people that there is always a right answer and if you get the right answer then you're clever and if you don't then you're stupid it is not brought people up to think there may be a whole bunch of right answers it is not brought up people to to know that actually there are some unsolvable problems and i think it's it's significantly brought them up to be pleasers to you know just tell me what to do and i'll do it give me a safe environment to do exactly what i'm told so that i can say that i've been successful and um and it's interesting cuz the other night i took part in a uh, memorial service for sir ken robinson who was the champion of opposite thinking you know who said actually creativity is what makes human beings unique we have built the world we live in this is unique creativity is the heart and soul of humanity and that's what we should be educating with and for so he stood so firmly against that very behaviorist take on education um and it's so interesting you know because i work with lots of companies and lots of them say to me how can i make my people more creative margaret and i say Well, what are you doing to them? Well, it's you know, ranking, assessment, incentives, all this. I say, throw it all out. Just get rid of it. Get rid of the rules. You know, stop doing it, and then see what happens. And of course, most of them are way too afraid to do that. So they are creating the conditions in which creativity will never happen. Um, but I would say, on a much more optimistic note. I'm also very struck that I would say the generation of young people in their 20s are for a host of reasons not all of them but a very significant proportion of them are much more critical of everything they're much more critical of capitalism they're much more critical of their governments they are much more critical of what they now see as bias and prejudice um and they are much less accepting that the way that their parents lived and grew up will produce the world that they want and it's almost like they were trained so much that eventually their brains had to break free and they are much more questioning than any generation i think since the early 1960s in the west and i find this really hopeful it's like having gone through the most rigid form of education ever they have quite a lot of contempt for it and definitely a lot of challenge and it's it's like if you take anything to an extreme eventually it blows up right and i think this is blowing up and i think when i see not just the demonstrations around black lives matter but demonstrations full of young people black white every ethnicity this is not a whole generation of people just fighting for their own kind 
they're fighting for each other. That really gives me hope that they're not prepared to be boxed in, even though that's exactly what their education taught them to be. Interesting. The world that we've come to inhabit right now seems to have too many differentiated parts, which is the core idea of complexity that you so elegantly point out and, and, mm. and it's, it's running a theme across your entire book. And it's, it's got differentiated part having nonlinear relationships. So you have emergent properties coming right. up. Uh, and this is only increasing. Yeah. Which means that for a person to, or for a group of people to even wrap their heads and hearts around what's happening, it would require patience. It would require a lot of diversity. Yes. To even start to make sense of what is happening. Um, I don't know whether I have a question on this, but uh, do you want to weigh in on this or expand on this something? Well, I agree with what you described. Absolutely. And I think that when you start to think of the complexity and try to kind of assemble it in your mind, I think it can be very overwhelming. And you certainly can't sit down and plot how we get from here to there. It's, it's way too complex. I think what you have to have is a lot of faith in human creativity. I think you have to have quite a lot of faith in a way in complexity because it throws up things we didn't see which are, you know, are quite often both negative and positive. You can look at the pandemic and say, of course, on one level, it's overwhelmingly negative. And on the other hand, you can see it's made a lot of people stop and think again very differently. So I think one of the, one of the characteristics of complexity is things are not either one thing or another, they are both things. And I think ultimately you have to have to appreciate that we have been dealing with uncertainty as humans all of our lives. All, I mean, ever, you know, throughout human history. And with few tools and little information have found our way through it. And people often say to me, well, Margaret, aren't you just suggesting we muddle through? <laughs> And it's, it's not quite as bad as that, I don't think. You know, I think we have more structures and knowledge and systems than just that. Um, and I think we do face very, very grave risks that if we aren't very independent in our thinking and if we don't resist this notion that, that the future is written, you know, these risks could easily destroy us. But I equally do have a very deep faith that if we can take responsibility for the world that we've created and have confidence in our creative capacity to make it better and safer, safer and healthier and cleaner, that we can get out of this mess. After that, what will we do? We'll probably make a different kind of mess, you know, but in a way that is our history. And I think that what we have to do above all is resist the simplifying myth that someone or something or some technology has the answer because that is bound to be wrong. Interesting. I'm mindful of the time. It's it's time up right now. <laughs> so so here's what we can do. We can end it here, and I'll figure out a way. But I have a bunch of questions that are still pending, and I would seek some of your convenience some other day if it is possible. And you know, if you can allocate another half an hour, and we can we can do. Okay. That. Yeah. Sure. No, so, I'll definitely to find that. I've really enjoyed this conversation. You ask wonderful questions. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. I'll look forward to part two. Yes. <laughs> okay.
Thanks so much.